All right, before I get started, how many of you in here are the students who work in the lock and have actually pushed the button to send the commands up to Kepler? Wow, thank you guys. Good job. So far, so good. <laughs> Keep it up. That's great, I appreciate it. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about planets a little bit, and I'm going to talk about stars, but I also want to show you some of the, as, as we, uh, we say, sort of the sausage making, how we take the data, which you all say, God, you use that crappy stuff, and how we get good light curves out of that. So um, I'll, be, I'll be interested in some of that. But I wanted to start with a little history. It's always important, I think, to look back on history a bit and see what kinds of things people thought about, what kinds of things they knew or didn't know, and how to find our place. I mean, Kepler's this sort of very um, philosophical mission at some level. And another talk I could have given, but I won't today, is on all the religious aspects that Kepler has really brought to light within NASA and within the Kepler project, and, and people we talk to and people we don't want to talk to. But it's very interesting stuff for a whole other time. Anyway, so I'm going to talk a little bit about history then the, the Kepler mission. If you haven't seen pictures of it, I'll show you some of the pictures of the spacecraft and stuff. Um, and then sausage making planets and so Bruno, everybody knows Bruno. If you take a philosophy class, you have to learn something about Bruno. So in the late 1500s, he was, you know, everything. If you could read, you had all these names after you. You were, you were a mathematician, an astronomer, and everything that you could read. And he believed in these theories that went, on, went beyond sort of the Copernican model and talked about that there are other inhabited worlds. And of course, this is not a good thing to stay, say, in the late 1500s in Italy. And so what happened to Bruno is he was burned as a state for Fortunately, today we can say these things, and so far we don't get too burned at the stake. The Roman Inquisition hasn't shown up yet. But we have had some nasty folk on it. Another person who I suggest, if you're interested in a loony, crazy scientist, look up this guy here. This guy Lardner, I mean, he even looks a little weird. But look him up. He had a really interesting life as a, a sort of scientist. But one of the things he did was he wrote this physics, or this natural philosophy and astronomy book. It became really popular in the mid-1800s. And that's good, you say, but the bad part about it is that people read these things, and what you say in there, they believe, is some kind of a fact or some truth. And this guy was talking about how you explain variable stars. And at that time, people knew about variable stars, things like Cepheus and Aurora's, some eclipsing binaries that change their brightness by enough you can see with your eye. It's pretty obvious in some cases. So he talked about it and said, hey, maybe these are due to planets. They're actually passing in front of that star. And they went on to say, well, you know, if it was a planet like in our solar system, the signals would be too small for anybody to ever detect. So let's just forget this. This was just a, a theory, but it's really crappy. So we'll never think about planets or being stars anymore. And this really had a profound effect in the literature on people not believing that you could ever detect planets, even into the, the late 1900s. So exoplanets is a young field. In fact, this field is almost as young as some of you people in the back of the room. So you kind of are growing up with exoplanets. For those of us that are a little older than the people in the back of the room, we remember a time when the word exoplanet didn't even exist, and nobody even thought about finding planets around other stars. So the sort of the first attempt here was in 1988, and it was suggested, and the, the phrase exoplanet was coined in this paper, but no one believed that it really didn't go anywhere until a number of years later where it was confirmed by radio blocks. The famous two are these. These are probably the ones you read about in textbooks and learn about. The planets that were found around the pulsar by using timing variations. And that's interesting because Kepler uses timing variations as well as transit detections for uh, different things it can learn about planets. And then 51 Peg, the sort of first hot Jupiter famous uh, planet that was found in 1995, and kind of set the stage for the fact that we believed at that time that the most common solar systems were solar systems with inner large planets, the so-called hot Jupiters, because those were the ones that were being found from the ground. We knew 15 or 20 of those, and our solar system seemed to be completely wrong. So if nothing else, Kepler has shown that our solar system looks like pretty okay, so you can breathe easily again. It's okay. Jupiter's probably not going to come screaming in and kill us anytime soon. All right, so Kepler was launched three years ago uh, in two months or something like that. And this is what it would look like if you were out in space and stared at it. It looked just like that. Um, so it was made to do really precise photometry to find exoplanets. But it also does really great work on stars, too, on astrophysics. Not only on the planets the stars orbit, but also on uh, other, I'm sorry, the stars the planets orbit, but also on other stars as well. 
And we were just extended uh, by NASA through the senior review process for another four years. And that's very exciting news for us and for the parents. And thanks a lot for all your help. So we, it monitors 150,000 stars in a 100 square degree region of the sky. So how many of you know how big a 100 square degree region of the sky is? If you looked up, how big would it be? OK. That big? Yeah. Got people like this? The hand, the old hand, right? Your hand and arm's length is about 100 square degrees. So as a homework assignment, if that's 100 square degrees, how big is the Hubble field of view when you look up in the sky? So you guys can figure that out. I'll ask you after we figure out this. OK, if you haven't seen Kepler, I know at least one person here used to work at Ball probably, probably saw this before. So this is the spacecraft over here, where the mirror will sit on top of this in the telescope. This is the uh, one meter primary mirror. Kepler is a Schmidt telescope. A Schmidt telescope is a great way to get a big field of view, but it's not such a great way to get a really good plate scale or a really good arc seconds per pixel. So you get a big field of view, and for photometry, you don't care so much about the plate scale. So this was the reason a Schmidt telescope was designed and used. This is the imager that Kepler uses. It's an array of CCDs. There are 42 CCD pairs. And then at each corner, there's a small CCD, which is used for the guiding of the telescope, for the fine guidance. So these CCDs are read out in five sections. There are five rows of them across here. They're read out using similar and the same electronics. So there's a lot of crosstalk that goes on, because all the electronics are sitting in this box right behind the CCDs. So if you were to design an instrument with no crosstalk, you would, wouldn't design this instrument. But this is the only way you can pack all the electronics into something that's small and can fly on the spacecraft and hides behind your focal plane so you don't have any light loss. And these small CCDs here, they said, are used for the fine guidance. And Kepler's a really impressive telescope. If you ever want a telescope built, all aerospace does a pretty good job. So these, these uh, we turn the spacecraft, as you guys know, to um, download the data and we turn back. And it, refines its position and points to within one one hundredth of a pixel when it points back. And that is really critical for Kepler photometry. It sounds like an amazing thing and why do you care? But that difference between one or say three hundredths of a pixel changes the photometry of a given star by two to five parts per million. And we can detect that. And that's bad because it looks like a transit of a very small planet. And if we see these things, we go and spend a lot of time thinking they're transits and they end up being some little motion. So it does a really good job. And this slide is one of my favorite slides. I, I show this in all my talks if I can. Even if I'm not talking about Kepler, I throw this in. I just think it's such a cool slide. Because I remember that day, and I remember that day. <coughs> and that's just really pretty cool to draw something up, and then here it is put together at a call. So this was the part we saw before down here. Spacecraft that now has some extra stuff on it. And this is the telescope up here. This is the radiator to take away all the heat out in space from all those electronics. The solar panels back here that are always pointed to the sun to give us our energy. And it's basically nothing but a Schmidt telescope in there with that large focal plane sitting in the middle. So it's a very simple thing. Kepler has one moving part in the telescope, and that one moving part is the focus. And we never move it. So, and we probably never will. <laughs> so, Basically, it's a really, really simple design. So it's very nice. This is the proof we really actually did launch, although these could be fake, you never know. We actually have a person who doesn't believe we were launched. So, um, yeah, but th this picture here, I don't know if, you, if you've been to a launch, but if you have, you, you, know, you don't see all that once. It's a time exposure. But it, it looks like it's going right down into the ocean. It's really not a great picture to show the public on it. <laughs> They don't understand, you know, the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> so, anyway, there's a lot of fun. Launches are always great to go back in. And here's the field of view on the sky. You know, the constellations and all. Uh, we're looking at uh, constellations Cygnus and a little bit into Lyra. This is the Milky Way, depending <coughs> across here. And Kepler's original field of view, th these represent those 42 CCDs, those little pairs of CCDs. And you notice there's gaps in between. And those gaps are pretty big. They're about three degrees of the gap. But the nice thing is, and you can't tell so much from this picture, but a lot of the very bright stars purposely were made to fit in those gaps. So we don't image these very bright stars. 
But the original field of view was, was that orientation, but was sitting about here. And it was sitting here because originally it was thought where you can get the most stars is looking right at the Milky Way, because that's where most stars are. But unfortunately, if you look right at the Milky Way, blending of stars is a tremendous problem. There are just so many stars, that every star is blending with some background stars. And disentangling a background variable and a transiting exoplanet would be nearly impossible. The other thing you know, if, if you know, see this picture of the Milky Way or know about the Milky Way, there's these dark regions in here, this dust that hides stars in the background. So by putting it right on the Milky Way, you're actually losing stars as well because this dust hides a lot of background stars. So we pushed it off about five degrees off the Milky Way. And now we have a sampling of a very high density region down here and a fairly low density region up here. In fact, a lot of the stars up in here are giants or stars that are in the old disk or the halo. So it works out really nice to have this field move because we also can look at the planet distribution as a function of different <coughs> kinds of stars in different locations in the galaxy with different metal contents. So it's kind of a, a good thing for many, many reasons. Was the field view position determined before launch or after launch? Before launch. We did, yeah. Yeah. And it's the only field of view we've looked at, and chances are it'll be the only field of view we'll ever look at. So this, this field of view is going to become the most studied part of the sky that has it already. Every satellite, every telescope has studied this, or is studying this. So it's going to have multi wavelength data across everything. It'd be pretty amazing. So maybe we'll learn something from that. <laughs> so the, the field of view had two choices that were easy to do. One was in the northern hemisphere. The, northern sky. the other was an equivalent point in the southern sky. But we chose the one in the north because most of the people that worked on the Kepler project worked at or for observatories or universities in the northern hemisphere. And they could get access to northern hemisphere telescopes to do a large ground based follow up and help us understand the stars and the planets. And the southern hemisphere, we would have had a little more difficulty doing that. So that's kind of Okay, and here's the, whoa, that's pretty awful. It doesn't matter, it doesn't look very good anyway. This is the first light image, and if you go over by the, the mock, there's a great poster of the first light image that looks just like this. So I really just didn't want to show you this image, except to show you that there are open clusters. You can kind of see that's an open cluster over here. And this is TREZ-2. This is a, a, a hot Jupiter that was known before Kepler was launched. It happened to be a <coughs> field. As soon as we announced our field before launch, everybody who was doing planet surveys started studying our field of view. And I think four planets, three or four planets were found, all hot Jupiters before we launched. But what I do want to show you is this image. So this is one of those CCD modules, and they all have numbers and names. So it's 17 output 2 here in the lingo. And if you took an image like this at a ground-based telescope, you, you would just think the instrument was a piece of junk. And you wouldn't ever use this thing. You would go and complain to the director and say, look at this. this is but what you don't know is this isn't a piece of crap, right? This is good stuff. So Kepler has no shutter. Sorry, I can't stand it, I can't see. Kepler has no shutter. So it's just read out continuously. We integrate for six seconds, we read it out, and we store 150,000 plus about 20,000 more little postage stamps around the stars. We don't store every pixel. We read it out again, and we do that over and over and over, and co-add the data either in one-minute samples or 30-minute samples. Many more 30-minute samples than one-minute samples. But all of these long streaks are these bright stars that just bleed all the way across the CCD. You can see every one of them is associated with a bright star. And these stars bright, these might be fourth magnitude to eighth magnitude, so they're pretty bright stars, um, even for such a short exposure. But the nice thing about it is, that bleeding is incredibly constant. So you can remove it. Or, in fact, you can do photometry on it. We now have just found, no, I can't say this. We may have just found <laughs> something, which might be a planet, <laughs> orbiting a star that's brighter than that object, which just bleeds tremendously across. And all you do is you just add up all those pixels. Because all the light's there. It just is spread out over many, many pixels. And you add it up and you get a great light curve. In fact, it's really fantastic because your signal noise is phenomenal in that kind of light curve. We also can see lines going across this way. 
These are those lines of crosstalk between other CCDs that are reading out at the same time. There are also lines that you can't see in here that have these sort of diagonal stair step shapes. And those are crosstalks from the guide CCDs reading out at the same time the science CCDs are reading out. But again, all of that is constant. It has exactly the same time all the time, exactly the same level. You just remove it all, and you get an image that looks like this. So this image over here is the same stretch as this image over here. So I'm not trying to pull one over on you by hiding all the crap in the back of the stretch. And you can see now the background here looks pretty smooth. You'd, you'd like this image, except you'd say, wow, the focus is pretty awful. Look at that, all the stars are squares. And if you blow it up, that's what they look like. Kepler's pixel size on the sky is four arc seconds in one pixel. So this star here, you can maybe kind of tell these two grays are a little less than those. So this has something like a full width half max of a pixel and a half or something. It's like six arc seconds. You're in space, six arc seconds, that's nutty. Well, it was done for two reasons, and they both actually turn out to be the same reason. If you have a Schmidt telescope that's perfectly in focus, you make a star shape, the point spread function, we call it, that's very spiky, and then it has very broad wings. And if you know anything about doing photometry, you never want a star to look like that if you want to do accurate photometry. The reason is that sharp peak falls inside one of those pixels. And as the spacecraft jitters, albeit very little, maybe one one hundredth of a pixel, that peak moves around within that pixel. And the quantum efficiency of a pixel is not constant across the pixel. Within one pixel, it changes by a little bit. But at these levels of precision, that would matter. So you want to blur your star image, you want to blur your point spread function. And so we purposely do that. It's a soft focus purposely. So unlike Hubble when it was launched, it had a soft focus not on purpose. <laughs> we purposely have a soft focus. Now that's bad in the sense you can't show any pretty pictures because they all look like that or they all look like that. So you have to kind of you know change your thinking and show a beautiful light curve and get all excited that that's a pretty picture. That's something that you know, you'll never see like that as good as Kepler. So let's talk a little bit about how Kepler finds planets. So how many of you saw the Venus transit in uh, 2004? Anybody? Excellent. Wasn't that cool? Okay, so you were acting just like Kepler. You see Venus go across the, the sun and you can detect it. Now that's not quite true because you can resolve Venus on the surface of the sun. It, it's hard, it's tiny, but you can do it. Kepler cannot resolve the planets going across their stars. But it can see the drop in light that that planet blocks out as it moves across the star. It's pretty amazing that they can. So this is Mercury. This is a real Mercury transit in 2006. And this is a time lapse of Venus. And if you don't know, June 5th this year, there's another Venus transit. Some of you are young enough. You can wait for the next one in 2117. So there you go. Don't worry about the one this year. You've got another one. So this is what Kepler does. It finds transits, but again, it, it never can see this. It sees the star as a dot, and it can tell about this little bit of light that it's blind. So here's a light curve. On top is a raw light curve that comes from uh, a set of pixels around a certain star. Each of these chunks is, there's four of them showing up here, are these so-called Kepler quarters. So each of these is a three month chunk roughly when Kepler's pointing at one orientation. After three months, it rotates by 90 degrees. But if you remember that focal plane, it's, it's symmetric to rotations. So you rotate by 90 degrees to keep your solar panels pointed at the sun. Your stars are pretty much the same stars, but now they fall on different pixels on different CCDs. So what happens is this star, when it moves to a different set of pixels, it changes by a percent or something in its flux, up or down. They don't all go up, they don't all go down. In addition, there are these <coughs> drops here that you see. Those are thermal effects where the CCD changes its temperature very slightly and it takes a while to equilibrate. And that changes 
the expansion of the telescope, and that changes the actual star range. It gets slightly bigger or slightly smaller. And this is slightly differences here. But that's maybe a half a percent, a third of a percent or something. So the things we notice. So this is what we get out of the spacecraft. This is what we get from the pipeline once we run some magic on the pipeline. So you take that, you basically stitch it all together, try to remove the artifacts. We know a lot about them now. Again, they're all pretty constant. We know how to deal with them. And you get a light curve that's like this. And I think this is pretty easy with your eye to see the planets here. This happens to be a light curve of a, a star with multiple planets. You can see some of the transits here match up their, in their depth. It's kind of like a puzzle when you see a light curve like this. <coughs> which transits match with which other ones? What's the period? What are the planets? I think this has five planets in this particular one. So here, it's pretty hard to see them, but here it's pretty easy. Now we don't look at every light curve by eye. We used to. <laughs> There's a lot of light curves, but now we have, you know, we learn about them. Let me tell you a little bit about this sort of sausage process of how much work is done. And fortunately now it's mostly all done, you know, as they say, in software. So if we start with a typical search of one quarter of data, so a three-month chunk of data, we find from the 150,000 light curves, so we're looking at 150,000 stars, most of them sampled every 30 minutes, we get about 20,000 events that look something like a planet transit. So that's a pretty high number. So the first year, we would literally look through 20,000 light curves. And we had each light curve looked at by at least two people, just to make sure. Now we look through maybe 500 light curves that are weird for some reason. So of these 20,000 events, this visual inspection, the visual housing quotes, because it's mostly done by computer, finds that something like 2,500 of them are already planets we found the last time. So that's good, we feel good, we pat ourselves on the back, we push them off to the side. Something like 2,500 of them are eclipsing binaries that we mostly already know about. That's good, we found them again, we push those off to the side. Something like 15,000 or so of those things come out to be false alarms. So they're not really a planet transit. And false alarms can be all sorts of things. The largest false alarm is literally just something that's junky data cause it gray, it's a bad pixel, it's something that's not real in any, any way. And so those are hard to throw out because they often look like something real. And we're talking about you know, 10, 15 parts per million signals here, it's pretty tough. But again, we're doing pretty good now to throw these out. We use other things like the shape, if it's a planet transit, it has to have a certain <coughs> shape, we believe. We get fooled on that actually with uh, planets in orbit M stars. If you know something about a planet transit, that orbits something like the sun, it has a U shape to it. I'll show you some beautiful examples here in a moment. If you have an eclipsing binary, it often makes a V shape for eclipse or transit. So we thought, this is easy. U shaped planet, V shaped eclipsing binary. Well, take yourself a nice model of an M star, a really cool M star, with lots of limb darkening and some spots on it, and run a planet across it, and all of a sudden, the planet transit looks like a V shape. Wow, there's a surprise. So, you, you learn here, it's a learning box. Let's see, move on. So you get maybe a thousand new planet candidates. You then go into some more serious vetting of these candidates. Easy things like odd even transits. If it's a planet transit, the first, third, and fifth better look like the second, fourth, and eighth. Because it's the same planet going back, right? If it's an eclipsing binary, they often look different. Simple thing works pretty well. We can take Kepler data itself and look for centroid motions on those blurry images, <coughs> but we can do it. And we can look at difference images. And th that works to, s to help you if it's a background eclipsing binary. So if I have a bright blobby star and nearly co-aligned co with it, and I can't tell the star is there because it's blended, but much farther in the background is an eclipsing binary. Well, every time that binary eclipses, this bright star looks like it gets fainter, like it has a transit. But it's really the summation of this faraway binary of this one star. But what it does is it changes the center of light during the transit compared to not during the transit, in this case during the eclipse. Because when that thing eclipses, this all of a sudden becomes slightly brighter in a centroid sense. And you can tell, you can see this thing move by again a hundredth of a pixel or so. And if you see this shift, 
during the transits in the right direction, then you know it's not really that star that's that transit. So there's a lot of neat things that we've learned how to do with the Kepler data itself, as blurry as it is. So out of this initial start of 20,000, you might find 500 <coughs> planets. These KLIs are called Kepler objects of interest, but they're more or less the planets that you get out. Now this is a list that's maybe only 85% reliable at this point. And that's because there still can be a set of false positives. For example, hierarchical <coughs> triples, which are really annoying, that it's hard for any of this, this decision tree to get rid of. So these are passed on to the community, they're passed on to what's called our follow-up program, where we use our ground-based telescopes to go out and try to observe every one of these stars that have every one of these candidates and see if we can provide additional information to prove that that's really a planet or it's some other kind of false positive. Once we've done this, we believe we're maybe 95% complete, but it's never going to be 100. So at the, end, at the end of Kepler's life, whenever that is, we will never, ever have 100% reliability that everything we find is a planet. But if we find 100 planets like the Earth, who cares if 5% are wrong? I mean, that means there's 95 that are real. You may not know which one, but that's okay. Now part of this, this part here, this visual inspection, and down into this part here, let me show you one of the kinds of tools we use. So this looks like a mess, right? But this is, this is one of our computer-generated products we get. And what it shows us, these tell you what the things are down here. They're not on every form. This is obviously a tell you. But here we show the, the flattened light curve, red places where we think a planet transit is. So that's the original light curve. Then we phase fold the light curve. So here would be the transit. We put it at 0.75 so that we can look and see if there's something over here at 0.25. Because if this is a planet transit, there should be no so-called secondary eclipse. You can probably see it right secondary eclipse there. Then we look at a planet model fit. This is the model fit, the red line, the blue dots are the, the average points. Then we look at the odd even transits and we model fit both of those. We take that model and lay it on the odd transits and lay it on the even transits. And you can see it doesn't quite fit very well. It has this little bottom, it's too deep. So this would be a real quick way, and once you get good at these, to see this here and see this not quite fitting, and you toss it aside and say it's probably an eclipsing binary. And you put it in the eclipsing binary kit. And most of them that are, aren't, aren't um, bad pixels in that, most of them are pretty easy like this. You can see them and you just toss them on. And so the group that does this in the so-called science office, it's about six people that do a lot of this work, not all day, every day. They spend time doing this once or twice a month. <clears throat> they get down to viewing one of these about every two minutes. That's sort of their, their rate of viewing these. But as more tools and more knowledge <coughs> is passed, more computer stuff is done to find this. Because we now are searching this light curve to find that. And if you find that, you can throw it out without having to waste somebody's time looking at it. And searching these two phase light curves and throwing them out, they don't fit. So you start learning about your data and you can do a lot more to put things out about when we move to the ground-based work, so as I mentioned, we have this 85% reliable list we move to the ground-based work. We do three things, basically. This top thing, we do reconnaissance spectroscopy. So this is pretty low resolution spectroscopy, pretty low signal noise, so maybe one or two angstrom resolution, maybe a little better, maybe a signal noise of 20 or 30. So this isn't anything you're going to do great science on, but it's enough to tell you a few things about that star. Does it have the right temperature? temperature you think that star has? Does it have the right classification? Is it a main sequence star or is it a giant? We'll see in a moment that the way you know the size of a planet, you have to know the size of the star. All we measure is the relative ratio of those sizes. So if I think a planet's a certain size, but my star is a small main sequence star compared to a large giant, I can have the size of that planet be wrong by a factor of five or more. So my Earths can all of a sudden be Jupiter's, and that's not good. So this is a first step, and some things are thrown out here because they look like a eclipsing binary. You see two sets of spectral lines. Some things are thrown out because we thought the star was a G star, and the spectrum shows that it's an F star or a K star, some other kind of star, just because there was a problem with the photometric calibration. So this maybe throws out 5% or 2%, not a lot. 
We also do high resolution imaging. We take uh, adaptive optics image and spec speckle imaging and look for very close companions, not physically close, but co-aligned companions, to see if there's a possibility of some star that's, say, sitting 0.1 arc seconds away from this star that is either in front of it or far behind that could be causing this transit signal. And then if it is, if we find that star, we can't prove just because we see it there that it's causing the transit signal. But we then work harder with the Kepler data to see if we can tell if that star is causing the motion or not, or if it moves or not. If it passes these two tests, we then go to this level here, which is usually done with the Heth telescope in Texas or the Keck telescope, some big light bucket that has a very high resolution spectrograph. And we measure it at quadrature. So that's the point where the planet is either out here moving toward you the fastest or over here moving away from you the fastest. <coughs> if it was a binary star instead of a star on a planet, that would be your best chance of separating the two lines, the spectral lines from these two stars. So you look at those two points and see if you can find a second signature of a star. You also try to get masses or mass limits in most of our small planets by looking for radial velocity motion, looking for Doppler shifts. If you don't see a Doppler shift, you get more excited because it probably means it's a small planet and not a massive star that's causing the inverter. So these are the typical values we get from those three kinds of, of follow-up. And again, they're not super great, but they're enough to raise that reliability level up pretty high, 95% or more. So the temperature is to 150 Kelvin, low of G's, 0.2 dex. And this is the one here that's still really pretty tough. So you only know the radius of your star to about 25%. So again, that means you don't know the radius of your planet all that well. Now, if we can get seismology, or if we find planets around eclipsing binaries, then we can get the radius of the star to about 1 or 2%. So this is sort of the holy grail, but so far there's not many planets in eclipsing binaries. We have found um, nine already, but not anything like the thousands. Of them. And seismology works really well, but it can only work on the very brightest stars, maybe the brightest 100 or the brightest 200. Yes. So the reason you don't know the size of the star from the, the duration. Of right, we don't know the inclination, and we don't know if it's a circular orbit. So we make our model fit based on a circular orbit, and we can have some information on inclination. And then that depth is the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the sun. So there's a couple factors in there we just don't know. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is how you, you do transit. very easy. So if you could see a Jupiter transit, from the Earth. If you could, this is how Jupiter would look crossing our sun. So, wow, that's pretty big. You, know, you could resolve that very nice. And this is the lake curve it would make. It would have this cool rolling pattern to it. <laughs> so this is the lake curve it would make. So this is a real Kepler uh, lake curve. It's a planet that's 9.7 times the size of the Earth, so that's about Jupiter's size. There's absolutely no doubt this is real. This has a signal noise of 800 and you can see the characteristic U-shape here. Right? It's not a square, it's not an inverted top hat. And that U-shape is because of limb darkening. Right? It's starting to look darker on the edges. So you get this characteristic U-shape. So 1% of all the stars, if every star had a planet, we would still only see transits for about 1% of them because we have to have the orbits perfectly aligned with the point of view that Kepler's looking. So anything Kepler finds, you have to take into account. You're already seeing the edge-on system. So many more you're not seeing. And it's the relative brightness. It's literally that drop in brightness it just gives you the ratio of the size of the planet to the size of the star. It's such a simple experiment. It's amazing how simple it is when it works. So let me show you a few examples of these. So over here is not a Kepler picture. This is a drawing of what the planet and the star's size would be if you could actually see the transit. So this is a pretty good sized planet orbiting a, a fairly, in this case, a, a late K star. So it's, we've only found one planet in this system. We think it has a 30 year orbit. 
1.3 times the size of Jupiter. Its transit is 48 hours long, so it has a long period. Now, the way we estimate this 30 years is we take that time, assume it's a circular orbit, and then say, what would its orbital period be? Now, we will never see this transit again, so we will never know. But I can't imagine even Kepler would work in 30 years from now. But this is at least some evidence that planets like our Jupiter exist in at least one other solar system. So they belong up here. The hot Jupiters, the so-called close-in big planets, are becoming a real interesting gold mine for people that like doing planet weather and planet atmosphere. So here's a planet that has a period of 1.8 days. It's 1.2 times the radius of Jupiter, and it's three and a half times the mass of Jupiter. So this is the so-called hot Jupiters. These things are just screaming along the surface of the star that are orbiting. Here's the transit down here. The thread is the model fit to the data. They are indistinguishable in this case. We have so many transits. Every 1.8 days we see a transit. So there are literally hundreds and hundreds of transits that you go back here. It's just spectacular. But the neat thing is, if you look at the light curve on the other side, when the planet goes behind the star, you see this thing that's called a phase curve. And you can see the dip here of light actually can see the drop in the reflected light from the planet's surface as it passes behind the star. And this kind of works, my little, my little ad up here, it kind of works like Venus. You, know, you have these phases of Venus where it goes around the sun. <coughs> and, and that would be the occultation over there when you have a full Venus or a full planet. So this shape and this shape can validate these planets all by themselves because you can fit models to both of these can tell if it's a circular orbit or not, and you can eliminate the possibility that it's a binary star or some other triple or some other background eclipsing binary. But even more interesting, this curve going up and this curve going down tell you about how light reflects off that planet's atmosphere. And so far, in the five or six cases we can do this, this for, and there'll be many more as we collect many more transits, none of them have a symmetric up versus a symmetric down. So they should if, if the planet's just sitting there. But what this tells you is there's heat circulation on the surface of this planet. It has a rotation. There's atmospheric motion that's carrying some sort of heat in one direction, making the planet slightly brighter in that direction. So we'll be able to do planet weather from these. And as time goes on, maybe you'll see it change. So it's a really interesting new branch of, of work that's coming out of Kepler. And there's just so much to do here, and we have a bunch of people back here, so we'll be doing this after <laughs> you know, There's a lot to do, so that's pretty neat. Another neat thing that's come from Kepler is the discovery of non-transiting planets. And there was just a paper announced about finding one of these. Well, there's many, many of these that are probably going to be found. So here's an example. This is a, uh, a relatively small planet in this case, two and a half times the size of the Earth. It has an 11-day period. So the first 45 orbits, this, this was the phased light curve, and these are the first 45 transits stacked right on top of each other. Starting in orbit 46, the transit started becoming a longer and longer and longer and longer orbital period by a little bit each time. The transit had changed its time. The orbital period was getting longer by a few minutes each time. And it is almost certainly due to some other planet that's in this planetary system, which doesn't transit, but has a relatively close orbit to this one, and is gravitationally interacting with it, and causing these two to exchange energy and exchange orbital periods. And if you plot the so-called O minus C diagram for this, so if the, the time zero would be the transit would occur exactly when you predict it to occur, if the orbital period is constant. Here's the first 45 days. And you can see on this graph that even though we thought it was pretty constant, it had this little curvature to it here. But after day 45, it changed. And over 200 days, the orbital period of this planet changed by 1.6 days. We're now watching this one, and this curve has started to roll over. So eventually, the period of this changing transit here will allow us to estimate the mass of this planet and its perturber in this particular solar system. And there's a lot of these. We see lots of planets where the transit times change, and then you can use that to estimate masses and orbits. 
very fun. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the traditional secular interaction through sinusoids biases not a sinusoid. Well, probably the reason is because there's more than one other planet. In the complex systems that we see with three, five, and seven planets, and, and there's fours and six, and three, five, and seven seem to be the ones that occur right now anyway, the, the patterns are incredibly complicated, as three planets are exchanging energy. So a lot of neat dynamic science is going happen. And then multiple planets, as we've talked about before, here's, we have over 400 solar systems, so things with multiple planets here. This particular one has three planets. Our record so far is six, but three of them have six now. So you know, before long, there'll be seven, eight, and eventually like nine, like our solar system. <laughs> 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 now, <Pluto's laughs> okay, so, and again, they're pretty easy to see here. You just start matching up. It's a little puzzle game. Uh, this is uh, the famous Kepler 11, the first really multiple solar system <coughs> seen, kind of a nice light curve here. This is, of course, what you find when you look for a short amount of time. So this is the Kepler-11 system on the same scale as our solar system. And you see that all the planets here are, are basically jammed almost inside the orbit of Mercury. So they're really close in. And of course, when you look for a little bit of time, you find close-in planets. As Kepler <coughs> continues to look for longer time, you find longer period planets. So it seems like that planets are everywhere. They're in all kinds of orbits, and you know, we're going to eventually find something that looks just like us. Another one of my favorite solar systems is this one. So the other one, everything was jammed inside uh, Mercury's orbit almost. Here's a small M star with its three planets. And on the same scale, here is our planet Jupiter with its four largest moons. And this is just pretty cool. So here's the entire solar system. Here's our, our planet. You name the size, you name anything, and you'll find it. You work right now. This is good. Okay, so we talked about Jupiter before. So Here's the sun, or here's the Earth transiting the sun. I don't know if you can see it. So this is the excitement you'll see if you if you actually just use your eye to look at the transit of Venus. It, it's it's possible, but it's tiny. So this gives about a one percent drop, and this gives about a one one hundredth percent drop. And again, it's just the ratio of the planet size to the star size. So that transit is really easy to see. This one's not so great. This is a real light curve down here. And again, if you average over time transit shows up. So you just have to collect many, many of these. Now that sounds easy. Well, it is easy in this case because this has a 20-day period. So if Kepler looks for a year, you get a lot of transits. You can come out a bunch. But we're trying to find planets this size that have one-year orbital periods. So if you see one of these, well, you're not going to believe it. So three or four or five or six or something is what you really want. So you have to look for period you care about times three or four or five or six years, right, in our case. So Kepler just has to keep looking. But after a couple, you can see it. You know, maybe cool people even get this. So just to show you that Kepler finds lots of these, and they're really easy if they're bigger, right? These are now things between two and three times the size of the Earth. So sort of getting out toward Neptune. And, and these are trivial to find now. I mean, the software is so good. The detection algorithms are so good. The light curves are so good. So we have no problem finding these. But of course, the experiment was designed to find things that are one or three AI. And so that's always at the limit, because that's what you do. You push to the limit of your experiment. What can I just barely do? So if these were not easy to find, we'd be in trouble finding one or three AI points. So the latest discovery, which will be announced soon, so you're hearing it here first, is this particular object here, Kepler Object of Interest 245, which is known to have at least three planets two and a half planets. These two down here are enormous by our current standards. This is 0.7 times the radius of the Earth. This is 1.8 times the radius of the Earth. This one up here, if it's real, and the paper will tell you it's real, we all kind of believe it now, is only 0.3 times the radius of the Earth. So this is a little uh, smaller than Mercury, actually. So it's <coughs> the size of that planet. So it's pretty cool. Kepler is finding tiny things. And again, you win because these have such short periods. You see so many transits. It's kind of fun. So what was the period? 13 days. So lots of transits. So we won't be finding 0.3 in Earth limits. So how many of you have seen this movie? <laughs>
here's, here's the Kepler picture of the same thing. So this was Kepler's discovery of a planet orbiting the Cozy binary. It's the first one it was found. He said, we now have nine more and maybe even 25 that are even candidates. So it's certainly not as common, it seems, as single stars. And this is a Saturn-type object. It turns out this particular planet is close to the magical habitable zone, but the planet itself is like <coughs> Saturn, so it's probably itself not something we care about so much, but maybe it has a big but it turns out that these guys really suffer a lot. They are really messing with each other's orbit, these two eclipsing rockets, these two stars. But this object here, they are so far away, it just is a point mass. And the planet has a happy circular orbit. It'll be stable for the next five billion years at least. So this is one of those great you know, Newtonian things where you do doing calculus where it says, well, here's a big mass. And your teacher says, well, just approximately as a point source at the center. And you say, that can't work. You know, it does. It works exactly. <laughs> All right, so I just want to finish up on exoplanets. Um, this is our current uh, level as of February. There's actually about maybe a thousand more now that are coming through the light. And you can see that if you look at the times here from June to February to uh, this, this current February, that we're pushing the smaller planets and out for longer periods. And that's just, we understand our data better and we look for a longer time period. You can just match transit of front transit. Nothing special about that, but we're going in the right direction. And if you take a, a census of the size of planets and you bin them up into these sorts of bins here from Earth and the magical super Earth, we don't know what to call these because our solar system doesn't have any of these. And if we have these, then we jump to this. So it turns out that Jupiter's aren't all that common. And Kepler now is essentially 100% confident in finding Jupiter. So there's not a single Jupiter that we would miss. You know, possibly a very little grazing. But, so this is a really well-validated number. There just aren't many big planets in relatively short period orbits. But as you go to smaller planets, this rises, and these are not yet statistically significant because we just haven't found them all yet. But I bet it's gonna be that this is just gonna shoot up. Like with everything, there'll be more small planets by far than big planets, and small planets are rule the universe. Okay, so running late. Always the case. But I just want to talk about a few cool things in stars. And I'm happy to talk to people afterwards about stuff. So, seismology, you've heard about seismology. Well, Kepler is doing seismology with its light curve, people working on the data, all sorts of people. This is a power spectrum of a particular uh, star that has a planet. This happens to be an F subgiant. It has a pretty small planet, 1.6 Earth radii in a short period orbit. But because we had seismology on this, we know values of this star incredibly well in terms of its mass and radius, so we know the planet size incredibly well. So that's one of the neat things you get from seismology. And the other really nice thing about seismology is you can tell main sequence stars from subgiants and from giants. And remember early on we talked about if you don't know the size of the star, you don't necessarily know the size of the planet. Because like, it's just a ratio. And so if I think a star is a main sequence star, but it's really a subgiant or a giant, the planet will be a different size. So if I can get seismology information, I can tell from their power spectrum because they tell me how the modes work inside these stars. I can tell them apart. That's very nice. I have a question. Yep. All right, so you're only looking maybe three, four, five pictures in a star. How do you get the seismology on that? It's all just coming from the, the light curve itself. It's just the variations in the light curve. It's little pulsations in the star's atmosphere that are telling you about the modes that operate in the star. You're, you're not resolving the star. Seeing them all in the light. So the things you can do with that, which are really neat, are you can separate stars on the red giant branch between ones that are ascending the red giant branch and ones that are descending the red giant branch. You can't do this any other way because they don't—they look the same to you on the outside, but they're fundamentally different on the inside, and that's where these pulsation modes really help you. So you can separate the ones between these particular pulsation modes and those. So that's really. Neat. Another really new result here is the rotation period of the core of a red giant. And you can get the rotation period of the core, you can never see it, but you get it because of the modes that propagate through the star. And you can see that for these red giants here, the ones that are relatively small <coughs> and still moving up the red giant branch, they have a very different rotation and it breaks very quickly here and goes to another level of rotation. So this down here is the size of the star in solar radii, and that's the rotation of the 
four in days. So it's a really cool result here. Now, these two last results are red giants, and that's because the red giants tend to be bright, right? They're very moving stars, and the seismology for them so far has been superb. Now it's moving down to main sequence stars where, again, you just look out longer and longer and longer, and you co out all your data, and all these pulsation modes just pop right out. So it's working on those. Let me just show you one more example here. This is a really cool light curve. See, the great name for it, a fake. <laughs> one of my students, this, this is their clever thing, they're naming all the light curves now. There's a lot of them. They're running out of names. Um, so what is it? Could be stars, you know. and you can see over here. This is a normalized light curve. So the depth over here, this is 0.95, and that's one. That looks awful big for a planet. Right? So right away you think, oh, maybe this is going to come too far. So with some ground-based spectra, <coughs> seeing what the stars, and now you came up with this model, of this object. It's a system containing five <coughs> stars, where this pair orbits these three that pair orbits that. So it's just a really <laughs> complex star. And they all, of course, are perfectly aligned to us because we see every one of them eclipse every other one of them in, in crazy sequence of which one's eclipsing at which time. This is just fantastic. So the neat thing we're going to do, well, that's already neat. The neat thing we're going to do is we're going to get a high resolution image of this. These two are about a tenth of an arc second we should be able to see the system for higher resolution. So this is the model, and if you fit the model to the chunk of the light curve, the model's the red, and the chunk of the light curve black. It works pretty well. Now you might say, with all these eclipses and all the possibilities here, how do you know this is a unique model? Well, it turns out this model is not just running a spline of the data. This model has real stellar parameters in it of sizes and temperatures, so that can't make these dips be any bigger or smaller than they would be given whatever luminosity star is being eclipsed by whatever other luminosity star. You have to have all the orbital periods correct of all those, those little binaries. And so it's really a much more complicated model. It's not just a spline. And you see it doesn't work right there. And, you know, so it's not perfect. But it works pretty much everywhere else. So something else is going on there. But what a cool system. Yes, it's just Okay, I have one more. Sorry, one more because I promised you an education thing. Okay, now I'll quick. Okay, so this is a cataclysmic variable. This is a, an interacting binary. It's a white dwarf, which has a, uh, something like an M star orbiting it with a period between about 80 minutes and about four hours. So these have been known for centuries. People don't understand them ever. They have something to do with the disk, and there's all kinds of flaring and outbursts. And so the light curve comes along and every so often it has this brightening that's about, in this case, you can't really tell from the flux scale. But in this case here, it's about three or four magnitudes. And this is thought to be the accretion disk gets brighter. A bunch of some accretion event happens, the accretion disk gets hotter and brighter, and then it settles down. And you can see the outbursts aren't the same. <coughs> so we don't even understand that. Every once in a while it has this bigger outburst that gets much brighter, much longer, Astronomers have cleverly called this a super outburst. <laughs> so, yeah. And at the top of the super outburst, there's an incredible pulsation that goes on, which was always thought before Kepler to have something to do with the disk oscillating. This particular object was one of the first CBs that was studied in detail from Kepler. And by the time this first 90 day light curve was obtained, the sizes and shapes of the outbursts, the way this one worked, completely threw out every theory about how these things work. None of the theories work on this. None of the things they predicted were true. So it's kind of cool. In 90 days, he killed 50 years of science. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get to it. Let me show you. So here's the same thing here. I'm going to zoom in on this little piece right here. music out of light curves, and not just for fun. We're actually doing a project with people who are visually impaired. So this is the, these are all these, these oscillations. Your ear, 
your ear is really good at this because if you look at this, it kind of looks like it does the same thing. But let me jump to another place. Everybody's got that one memorized? It's in F minor, by the way. <laughs> It's not the same at all. It's just completely different in the, in the structure and the form of it. The amplitude is not the same. How it works not the same. Anyway, so that's a lot of fun. So we're doing this with all kinds of light curves. It's amazing the things we're learning. It's a lot of fun. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. One more. Really. Stop. Because I promised somebody else this one. Okay. So Doppler boosting or relativistic beaming. Um, you have two objects orbiting each other. When they're coming towards you or away from you, the light from them, because they're moving, is forced slightly into a cone. They become slightly brighter in the direction of motion because some of that light is forced into a cone. And when they go away from you, they become slightly fainter. And it's real slight. It's something like, at the best case that we thought we could ever do from the ground, 10 to the minus 3, so sort of in the milli magnitude level. So here's an experiment that was done using the Gemini telescope. It's an 8 meter telescope, far bigger than the we use three nights of data on a double white dwarf binary. So it's two white dwarfs. They're perfectly in line, so they're eclipsing like this and like this. So at one point, one's moving away and one's moving toward you. And it's a 5.6 hour period in this case. You have plenty of time to set a light curve. So you can fit the, the so-called beaming amplitude, this change in light that's only due to the fact that they're moving towards you or away from you, this relativistic effect. And you get a sign-like signal from it. This is it. You believe that's a good fit for the data. The colored points are different heights. And this amplitude, in this case, is three millimagnitudes. This was the best attempt to ever do this before Kepler was launched. Okay. Pretty good. I was involved in it. Okay. <laughs> okay, Kepler came along. Here's a light curve from Kepler with an orbital period of five days. Remember, that other thing was five hours. So each night you would get a whole orbital period. So you can never do anything in five days. Right? It's just never going to happen. And this has an amplitude of 10 to the minus 4. This is a white dwarf and an A star. So an A star is much larger and much more luminous than a white dwarf. You can never see this A star in any kind of observation you want to make. It just wouldn't show up. But you can look at this light curve. I mean, just look at it with your eye. And you can see the Doppler boosting. You, you can see how it's brighter here than it is here. This stuff just comes out of the Kepler light curves. This is just a phenomenal result. So this was actually fit and found the mass of this white dwarf, 0.22 solar masses. And this was the first example, although ours was kind of the first, but this is the first real example of getting a radial velocity curve from photometry. And that is really cool. If those two terms mean anything to you, think about that in like 20 minutes from now. I was right, that was really cool. <laughs> so, the neat thing about this is you cannot find the masses of small planets with spectroscopy, even using the Keck telescope forever. But there's a possibility we'll be able to get the masses of those planets simply from the Kepler light curve by using this technique and getting basically their velocity amplitude, their mass, by their light curve. That's pretty cool. Okay. So this is going to be a thing that people are not just jumping. Okay, I promise I'll stop. So, thanks. <laughs>